All right, you can go ahead and have a seat. Hey, Charlie, would you, I don't know if we'll use them, go ahead and pull these reserve signs in case we have some folks that want to sit in those seats. That'd be great. Thank you. Good morning, good morning, good morning. All right, so um, you're probably just kind of getting up and, it's, and you're just trying to wake up and get going. Uh, I, I've already done one service. I'm, I'm excited about this. So I'm just letting you know, if I move around, I talk really fast, get ready. Because I, I, I'm really excited. We're, at the, we're at, the, at the end of a season where we're in a series called Entering the Promised Land. We followed the Israelites from being 12 individual families um, in, in captivity, in slavery, in Egypt. And today we end up right at the edge of the Promised Land, which is where they were going in the first place. God brought them out of Egypt um, so he specifically could bring them to the promised land. He had a purpose. Just like us, God brings us out of something so he can bring us to something new. That's the whole plan. And by the way, the new thing isn't just a new religion. We don't really need another one of those. Yes, we have plenty of them. But, but, but to a, a life that is full and a life that is abundant, a, a, a life that is truly Living something beyond even the American dream, if you would. And so we're going to just kind of pick up this story in Numbers chapter 13. So if you have a Bible, if you want to open up there, otherwise the uh, pertinent verses will come up on the screen. Numbers chapter 13 says this, The Lord said to Moses, Send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I'm giving to the Israelites. From each ancestral tribe, send one of its leaders. God's intent here is to show them his goodness, that what he promised them, a land uh, described as flowing with milky and honey, in other words, in abundance, he, he wants them to go kind of see this. He wants them to, to understand his goodness and that it is time to enter into this land, to bring them to something new. Now, there's a, a map here of, of this kind of journey that they uh, uh, went on. I, the details aren't important, so I know you can't read the names of places. It doesn't matter. Other than to say they went from the bottom to the top of Israel, what would become Israel, um, and out again. And Moses uh, picks a leader from each of the tribes. He sends 12 uh, men to go up and to go through the land. And their job, he gives them two charges. Number one, hey, I want to know about the resources of the land. Is this, is this a good place? Do they have great resources? Uh, the second is, there, there is a military aspect of this. Hey, come back, let us know, you know, how many cities are there? What's their, what's their military strength seem to be like? Are they large cities, small cities, large people, small people, what, whatever the case may be. So we kind of begin to plan and see what God has to go before us to do. And so in this, God's faithfulness is revealed. This first part is God's faithfulness is, is, is revealed. In other words, God saying the, the thing that God promised, they can see before them. Picking up in verse 23 of chapter 13, it says, When they reached the valley of Eshcol, this is this journey, they cut off a branch bearing a single cluster of grapes. Two of them carried it on a pole. Imagine that. A cluster of grapes so big you have to carry it on a pole. Between them, along with some pomegranates and some figs, that place was called the Valley of Eskel because of the cluster of grapes and the Israelites cut off there. At the end of 40 days, they returned from exploring the land. They came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. So everybody, they're still in the desert and they send these folks to scout out the land. They come back to report. There they reported to them being Moses and Aaron, and to the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. Look at how wonderful this is. And they gave Moses this account. We went into land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is its fruit. Here's proof that it's fertile. But the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are, are fortified, and they're very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites live in the Negev, the Hittites, Jebusites, and Amorites live in the hill country, and the Canaanites live near the sea along the Jordan. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses, and he said, We should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly 
do it. Now, there are two parts to this report. The first part is, hey, it is everything that God said it would be. It is, it, it, now there wasn't literally milk flowing rivers, right? That's Willy Wonka kind of stuff. Um, but it, it was, it, that's an idea of it's fertile. It's a place where if you work and you put, put food in the ground, it will come forth. You're not fighting the land to feed your family. It's, it's a place where things thrive. And then the second part of the report is, uh, here's what it was. We found some hard military targets. There are some really big people. It's going to be hard land to take. Now, in, in Deuteronomy chapter 1, if you're a person who likes to kind of study beyond this, you might want to jot this down. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 1. Moses gives this account as the people are looking back. And he indicates that the people, just like God said, go spot the land, the people approached him and said, hey, we should spy out the land. And it says Moses thought this was a good idea. However, there's a, there is a difference. When God sends them to the land, he says, right, this is the land I am giving you. It's done. I just want you to see what I'm giving you. But when the people come to Moses and they say, hey, we think we should also send scouts, their motivation is they're wondering if they can take the land. God just wants them to see the land, but their question is, can we take the land? And as you see here in the last verse, in verse 30, Caleb rises up and he gives them a threefold challenge. First of all, he says, we should go up. Why? Because God commanded it. It's not, like, it's not a choice. See, they began to talk about this. And Caleb goes, wait, 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 wait. It ain't a choice. We should go. God told us to do this. We should go and take possession of the land. Why? Because God promised them the land. God said it. God promised it. And then he says, for we can certainly do it. Now, I don't think he really means, you know, I, I looked at the people, and I have a different report, right? They're really not that strong. They're really not that big. These guys are exact. No, I think he, it's the same report. But, when he, but when, he, when he says we can certainly do it, he means by God's power. It's almost as if Caleb lived our series that we just went through. Remember, here's Caleb's perspective of faith of what we just went through. Here's Caleb's perspective of faith. First of all, God miraculously delivered them from Egypt. Remember the whole plague thing and marching through the sea? God miraculously provides water and food in the, in the shape of manna in the middle of the desert for two years now. Two years. God miraculously helped them fight the Amalekites already. That was one of the people they said are in the land. They already beat the Amalekites. Remember, that was the whole Moses and the two holding up his hands. They were taken by surprise. They had no military experience. They kicked their tails because God miraculously showed up. God faithfully organized them to receive justice. Remember, everybody was standing in line, and God sends along Jethro, and they organize so they, they can receive justice. God faithfully gives them the law, and he brings blessing. He says, man, if you follow this, these laws, especially as a nation, you will be blessed. God faithfully forgave. Remember, as soon as he gives them the law, they break it. But God faithfully forgives them. God faithfully made his dwelling among them. That's the whole idea of the tabernacle. It wasn't some ethereal thing. God actually resided amongst them. God miraculously provided meat in the desert through the quail. And God faithfully forgave the leaders. Remember last week we talked about the rebellion of Miriam and Aaron. All along the way, God's power and faithfulness have been revealed. And this is Caleb's perspective so even though he has the same, he saw the same thing that they did. He saw the same strongholds that they did. He saw the same big, powerful army that they did. His conclusion is we can do it based on what God has already done. However, the people's unfaithfulness is revealed. Their unfaithfulness, the, the fact that, that they're not looking and considering what God has done they're only looking at, if you would, the reality of the situation. Verse 31 reads, but, don't you hate that word? Right? You get called into the boss's office. Well, I appreciate it, but, ugh. Right? That word can just, when it's, when it's followed by something bad and then someone says, but, then you're, that's good. But when it's followed by something good and then they say, but, ugh. 
But the men who got, had gone up with him said, We can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said, The land we explore devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of Anak come from Nephilim. These are like giants to us, a bunch of Shaquille O'Neal kind of folks. He's a big basketball player. We seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. The contrast here, it starts out with that, what I'm, what I'm calling the butt mentality. The butt mentality. It's that, men, it's that mentality that says, yeah, 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 but. I'll give you that one, but. And, and right, off the, right off the bat, we, you can see the tone, the air, if you would, just coming right out. As Caleb gives this charge, they stand up and they completely debunk the idea. And again, they say that the, 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 the people there were strong, the cities were walled, and there was giants in the land. All that is true. Caleb didn't say that stuff wasn't true. It's how they internalized it. And, and they actually said, and we saw ourselves as grasshoppers. I mean, something small that, that really is, is just a play that just needs to be stamped out. Everywhere but California where they're protected. But other than that, <laughs> something to be stamped out. That was their self-perspective. The facts were the same, but the conclusion was completely different. Why? Because their eyes weren't on what God had done, but on the reality of what had to be done. On the obstacles, not on the God who let them there. Caleb showed faith by saying, we are able, not because he thought they were stronger than they really were, because he knew God was stronger than whatever it is that was laid before them. You see, unbelief always fixates on the obstacles where faith sees a God opportunity. I'm not talking about rose-colored glasses. I'm just talking about a, a godly outlook that God can do what is beyond what we can imagine or think. Someone has defined a committee as a group of people who individually can do nothing and collectively decide nothing can be done. <laughs> and this, this is exactly what This is, the, by the way, the problem of group think. It's the problem of, what do you think? You know, before I make up my mind, I want to know, I want to know what, what, you know, what do the surveys say? And the problem is when God speaks, surveys never help you out. Because what surveys do is, is people look at the reality of the situation. They use, quote, unquote, common sense. If we know anything from God's word, he loves to mess with common sense. He loves to do the undoable. And so folks who say, you know what, I couldn't fight those, they come together, these 10, and they say, we could not fight that. And that mindset, once the people's eyes are shifted by this small committee and group think begins to take over, chapter 14, verse 1, that night, all the people, it starts with these 10, all the people of the community raised their voices and they wept aloud. Imagine if you would, the, the picture here is, is kind of like a, um, a young girl who since she was like 13 years old has been planning her wedding. She's got a little wedding box and ideas for the dress she's going to wear. And, and finally, you know, a young man who she likes proposes to her. And she begins to put together all the details, all this excitement. And on the eve of that, he backs out. And she cries aloud in bitterness. And in essence, all their expectations of entering the promised land and everything that was going to be, their attitude is if God backed out. That's all of a sudden eluded them, and they just weep. They're overcome with despair. Verse 2, all the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron. And the whole assembly said to them, if only we had died in Egypt. Does this sound like a broken record? 
or in the desert. Why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, we should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. In fear, they begin to focus on the outward feasibility of this campaign, and it is hopeless. They are not looking at the possibilities, but at the probabilities. Their message of this small group of apprehension and distress disseminates throughout the Israeli community. And even though right amongst them is the tabernacle, is God amongst this, all around the center of the tabernacle, the people are complaining and wailing and crying. Moses and Aaron actually in the um, five through eight come and they, and they begin to say, hey, and they begin to remind the folks, but group think has already taken over. They're already overcome by grief and sorrow. And so their old life begins to look better. Begins to look better. I see this constantly. I, and by the way, I wrestle with this. But I see this constantly. I, I see folks who, who come into the church and they've, they've got some issues. They've got some hurts. They've got some pains. They've got some brokenness. And they come into the church and initially they receive the good news and they are excited. They are thrilled. And then somewhere in their life they end up in the desert. Right? It gets a little harder. Right? The, the daily diet begins to be a little bit monogamous. And the daily spiritual diet becomes monogamous. And they begin to get depressed. And they begin to grumble. And oftentimes their eyes turn back to the way things used to be. And all of a sudden they don't show up. And, and you run into them somewhere. Sometimes I get a call or something like that. But usually it's out there somewhere. And the interesting thing is you get this, you know, it, it didn't work for me or, you know, I just had other things come up or, but the interesting thing is you can hear in their voice where they're at is no, is no better than where they used to be. They've, they've, they've traded God's joy for the past. The other interesting thing is here, I want you to note, they don't start saying, hey, there must not be a God. But that's not, that never even comes up because they've seen what he's done. They've seen his goodness. But what they say is, you know what? God must have brought us out here to perish. They don't doubt that he exists. They doubt that he's good. Matter of fact, I find that a lot of folks, folks who quote unquote don't believe in God because a lot of folks are really angry at the one they don't believe in. If he doesn't exist, who are you angry at? You know he exists. You're just angry because something in life was unfair. And I'm not saying you could have lost a loved one. You could have been suffering from a disease or some disaster. Could have, I, I'm not saying that bad things don't happen. And I, I understand questioning him. Anger. But be honest with yourself. Be honest. And in the midst of this pity party, they begin to say, we're going to go back to Egypt. But if we're going to go back to Egypt, we need other leaders. And so they begin to plan a, re a revolt. Starting in verse 10, but the whole assembly talked about stoning them, being Moses and Aaron. Then the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent meeting to all the Israelites. I, again, I see this all the time. Something goes bad, right? And rather than, you, you can't go and yell at God because he's God, right? So it's the pastor's fault. The church hurt me. The small group. And by the way, some of those things might be true. But you're really not angry at the pastor, at the church, at the small group leader. You're really angry at God. And, and they're, they're taking this out on Moses there. And then God shows up and the tone changes. Verse 11, the Lord said to Moses, Moses obviously sees him come down the tent and goes to see him. How long will these people treat me with contempt? How long will they refuse to believe in me? In spite of the miraculous signs I performed among them, I will strike them down with a plague and destroy them. But, Moses, I will make you into a great nation and stronger than they. 
See, a faith that can't be tested cannot be trusted. That's one of the reasons this hard thing is coming to the Israelites' life. A faith that can't be tested can't be trusted. Jesus explains this principle. If you remember, he, he talks about this parable of the two houses, one built on sand and one built on rock. The houses look the same, we believe, right? But the difference is when the rains come, that's the trouble. That's the desert. One house stands because it's built on the rock. One house washes away because it's built on the sand. You might want to make a note to read 1 Peter chapter 1, which also states this principle, that things come in our life as a way for God to grow our faith. Because this life is really about trust and love, not about stuff. And here the people fail the final exam. You see, everything up to this whole thing in the desert is, if you would, one big quiz. As a matter of fact, this journey starts out in, in uh, Exodus, right? You remember, right? They come out of Egypt. And as soon as they come out, there's what I call throwaway verses. They really can't be thrown away. But they're verses you just read through and keep going. You don't really think about. But the verses say, God did not take them the short way, because it would take them through the land of Philistines, and they would be afraid, and they'd just they'd give up. So instead, he took them the long way through the desert. Why? Because the desert was a series of quizzes. This is my word. It's not the Bible. The, the desert was a series of quizzes. And what's the quiz for? To keep you sharp, and they prepare you for the final exam. I understand you're not going to do so well on the quiz. I understand you'll be struggling with it, but the whole idea is so you know where you're strong, where you're weak, and you can show up in that. So when the final exam shows up, you're ready. And so here's the final exam. Caleb has the proper, he passes. He remembers the quizzes. He remembers where they messed up. And he says, hey, we're not going back there again. But the people take a vote. And they fail the final exam. And then God has a charge against them. And here's this charge. Number one, contempt. How, after all this time, can they despise? Despise the, the, my guidance. Despise my presence among them. How can they treat me with contempt after all that I've poured into them? The second charge is they refuse to believe. They, they, they refuse to trust my goodness. They refuse to believe in my power. After all this time. And so he declares what they deserve is I will wipe them out. I will wipe them out. Now, on one hand, that seems harsh. But on the other hand, if, if you've been following this journey like I have, you're kind of going, it's about time. <laughs> I mean, what more can you do? How can they not get it? How can they not understand over and over and over and over again? The record keeps playing. Wake up and smell the coffee. The New Testament um, echoes this whole idea too. In Romans chapter 6, verse 23, it says, For the wages of sin is death. In other words, if, the pro if you got paid according to what you do, like, like your wage, the appropriate uh, wage for sin, for broken relationship with God, not trusting God in his ways, is death. Is death. And that's what, what God suggests to Moses. Now, this is interesting because Moses kind of finds himself in a place where he defends the people. I don't think, I don't think God changes his mind because of Moses. Because if, if we know anything about the character of God, he already knows the end result, not only of, of what he's going to do then, but what he's going to do for all eternity. I really think, as a leader, I think it's for Moses. Because if anyone is going to quit, it's going to be Moses. And so Moses finds himself in a position saying, hey, God, you have every right to, but if, if, if you did wipe them out, then the, all the nations would look and say, hey, look, God just delivered them to destroy them. And that wouldn't do anything good. And so here's where we see God's grace and truth. Both his grace and truth. It's what we see here. Picking up in verse 20, it says, The Lord replied to Moses, I have forgiven them as you asked. And he does. He once again, he does not destroy them. 
Nevertheless, verse 21, as surely as I live and as surely as the glory of the Lord fills the whole earth, not one of the men who saw my glory and the miraculous signs I performed in Egypt and in the desert, but who disobeyed me and tested me ten times, not one of them will ever see the land I promised an oath to their forefathers. No one who has treated me with contempt will ever see it. But because my servant Caleb has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly, I will bring him into the land he went into, and his descendants will inherit it. So we see two things here. Number one, God continues to show them grace and mercy. He gets their forgiveness. But it comes at a price. There's still truth here. And God's judgment is threefold. Number one, the nation, wa the nation wanders in the desert for another 30. They've spent two years in the desert for another 38 years. Number two, anyone who's, who's 20 years and older, except for Caleb and Joshua, they all die. And third of all, you don't see it in the verses we just read, but if you read verses 36 through 38, the 10 unbelieving spies, the committee who started this whole thing, they all get a plague and die right away. There's an immediate judgment there for them. How many of us miss God's best because we can't get over what I, the, the, what I call the hump of old tapes, of old tapes, of the, of the old things? And this last part kind of addresses the Israelites and their old tapes. It's very interesting. Verse 39 of chapter 14, it says, When Moses reported this, in other words, what God told him about the consequences, both forgiveness as well as consequences, Moses reported this to all the Israelites. They mourned bitterly. Early the next morning, they went up toward the high hill country. We have sinned, they said. We will go up to the place the Lord promised. But Moses said, why are you disobeying the Lord's command? This will not succeed. You see, even in their repentance, they did not get it. Their omission of being sorry really isn't about, we're sorry for breaking relationship with God. We're sorry for, for not trusting. You know what their, their repentance is about? The consequence. It's the consequence, right? I mean, we all did this, and if you've got kids who are doing this right now, right, they'll, they'll get mad at, at, a, at a sibling or something like that, and they'll do something really that they shouldn't do, right? And you'll say, okay, well, you can't go to that party, right? And then they come to you, and they're pleading, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. They're not really sorry. They just want to go to the party. And that's exactly the, the, what's happening here. And, and Moses says, I can't believe this. Because what, what you're saying right now is we're ready, to, we're ready to go, but God just said don't go. You see, it's not a matter of what you do. It's who you trust. Let me say that again. It's not a matter of what you do. It's who you trust. There's not power in coming to church. That's not where the power is. There's not power in reading the Bible. That's not where the power is. There's not power in prayer or Bible studies or name any religious activity you want. There's no power there. It's when you do those things because you trust the one that it's all about. Yeah. That's the power. Just doing the religious activity gets you nothing. 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 I know I'm excited. I'm sorry. <laughs> Verse 44, nevertheless, in their presumption, they went up toward the hill country, though neither Moses nor the ark of the Lord's covenant moved from the camp. They, they basically said, we're going to do this. Then the Amalekites and the Canaanites who lived in that hill country came down and attacked them and beat them down all the way to Hormah. The promised land here eludes them because of their unbelief. They're trusting themselves and their reality rather than trusting God, and his power and goodness. It's an example, I mentioned this last week, of stinking thinking. Stinking thinking is reverting to old patterns of thinking. In the, in the recovery programs, it's, it's the way you used to think as an addict. But there's stinking thinking among God's people as well. It's when all of a sudden... You, you begin to hit the realities of this world and it becomes hard. And, and rather than focusing on God's goodness and power, you begin to focus on other things. Like resenting God's ways. You begin to, you begin to say, man, 
I remember when I could do anything I wanted to with my money. I, I remember when, when I, I also could kind of, you know, fudge the numbers or I could cheat on this and, and I had a little bit more income or whatever. You begin to resent God's ways or bitterness that sets in because God has not changed your circumstance. Can't believe God hasn't fixed this one. Like it wasn't you that caused it in the first place. When I say you, I mean me. Or we get tired of serving others. This whole, you know, there is no retirement in God's kingdom. We begin blaming God for the brokenness in our life. God, why don't you? Why don't you? Why didn't you? We begin to question God's goodness and his provision. God, maybe, did you just bring me here to make me suffer? Are you really good? Stinking thinking. We begin to foster a what have you done for me lately attitude. Right? We begin to measure God solely by what's going on right now. And if it's good, God is good. But if it's bad, it's like we've forgotten all the good he's done. And all we can focus on is, man, he's not doing squat for me right this minute. Or we give in to a I can't change mindset. I can't do it. I've tried and I've tried and I've tried. And it's I, 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 stinking thinking. Now, what I love is in the middle of this, there is hope. There is hope. It screams, but it's easy to miss. Because, again, it shows up in one of those, quote, unquote, throwaway verses, which you should never throw away. So I'm going to back up to chapter 13. We're going to look at verse 16. Now, what he's done is that in the preceding verses, he, you know, it's one of those lists that you just kind of go through really quick and you just move on because it says these are the 12 guys that he sends and it names fathers and sons that you don't know who they are. It's like, okay, why doesn't the Bible just say he sends 12 people and we get on with it? But it lists these 12. And at the end of this list, it says this in verse 16. It says, these are the names of the men Moses sent to explore the land. Moses gave Hosea, son of Nun, the name Joshua. And then it goes on with a story. It's easy to read by, by that. Because in verse 8, it actually doesn't say Joshua in the list. It says Hosea. And then it, it kind of gives this little, little statement. Now, here's the interesting thing. It's easy for us to miss this in English. But in Hebrew, the name Hosea means salvation. So, 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 so God, or not, uh, his parents gave him the name Salvation. And I, the Bible doesn't say why, but Moses likes this young man, sees potential, and kind of makes him his right-hand man, he, he, right? And he renames him Joshua, which means God is our salvation. Just a little, little change there. God is our salvation. And in fact, Joshua is the one who leads them. He becomes the leader. Moses doesn't even get into the promised land because of his, of his own contempt of God. But Joshua leads the people on God's power into the promised land. Now today, all over the world, the church of Jesus Christ celebrates the coming of another Joshua. You see, the Hebrew word Joshua is pronounced Yeshua. And in the Latin, they, in the Latin when they translated this name, they translate it Jesus, or Jesus, maybe in Spanish. And that translated in English is Jesus. It's the same name. It's why when the angel comes to Mary in the book of Matthew, chapter 1, verse 21, it says, you're going to name this baby Yeshua because, he says, he will save his people from sins. So God, from the very first, with, the, with his people, says, you know what? I promised the promised land. You're not going to miss the promised land. I'm going to deliver my people there. And I'm providing a leader for you, Joshua. But he's only a type of the one who is to come, Jesus. And so we celebrate Palm Sunday. When, as, as we've been told, we've been taught by the little ones and then by Malcolm, Jesus enters Jerusalem and they holler out, Hosanna! Which literally means, 
our salvation or God, God saves. But in this day and time, Hosanna means hooray for salvation. Because as Jesus came in, they were expecting God to save them. God to change the circumstances. Just like the Israelites from old were hoping when they were in Egypt that God would save them. And by the way, that's when Joshua was named salvation. When they were in slavery. Before God showed up. And Jesus arrives and the crowds are ecstatic. Hooray, salvation is here. Salvation is here. And just like a king coming conquering, they lay down the, the palm leaves and the jackets and the, it's a party. <laughs> the problem is, just like the promised land, it didn't look the way they thought it should. And when Jesus came, he didn't seem to holler at the Romans. Because to them, that's what salvation meant. Salvation meant politically, the bad guys get kicked out. They're the wrong party. The good guys take over. In their, in their eyes, all of a sudden there's peace. There's no more struggle. There's, everything kind of works. In their eyes, there's economic prosperity. Jesus didn't do any of that. Matter of fact, he didn't seem to be mad at the Romans. He seemed to be mad at the religious leaders. And so those cheers, as we heard from the crowds that sang Hosanna, whether it was a different crowd or the same crowd, they changed to crucify him. But you know what? That was God's plan all along. Because God knows the heart of men and women. Now we can't do it ourselves. We cannot take the land. We cannot enter in ourselves. And so Jesus did for us what we could not do for ourselves. And that's what it says. This is the power of the resurrection. Back to Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death. Here comes the good but. But. The gift of God, gift of God, is eternal life in Christ. That's the Messiah. Jesus, here's his title and his position, our Lord. The one who should control our lives. That's the good news, is that Jesus came so that we can enter the promised land. So here's the question I think we have to ask. Where are you in your journey to the promised land. Are you outside the camp? In other words, you don't know this God of love. You do not know this God of power, of goodness. To you, you're still thinking about a religion, a philosophy of life. Are you outside the camp? If you are, I would say there's an invitation. And I would also let you know this. The folks that seem to thrive the best in the kingdom are the folks that seem to be the furthest from God. So if you think you're irredeemable, you're actually a prime candidate. You're a prime candidate. Matter of fact, you're at the top of his recruiting list. Amen, right, Charlie? Or perhaps you're inside the camp in disguise. Now, if you are... I don't think anything I'm going to say is going to change your heart, so I'm going to talk to the rest of you. We have folks inside our camp that are in disguise. Be careful. Because when it comes down to the border of what God wants in your life, they will always show you, they will always show us reality. What can be measured? What makes sense? Be careful. Be careful. These folks show up all along in the desert. And by the way, in God's judgment, they almost always get wiped out, taken out. Because they were never his children in the first place, even though they travel. Because why? They're in it for the blessing. They're in it for the blessing. It's an it's a economic inner peace move. It's not I love God. It's not I trust God. It's really not I want anything to do with God. But I don't mind following along if it means good things will happen to me. And when the rains come, they will be revealed because they'll refault back to what man, what woman can do. These first two, outside the camp, those inside the camp disguised do never make it into the kingdom of God. Now, there is a third category. You're inside the camp, but you're unable to overcome the old tapes of your past. 
And this is, by the way, this is what motivated this series for me because I see a lot of Christians in this boat. You know Jesus died for you. As much as you can, you've mustered up enough trust and faith to, to allow that to overtake your heart and life. But as you go about life and you, you meet these things where you have, to, you have to take a step of faith, it just, you can't get over the old tapes. Now, if you want to study this first, uh, further, I would, I would encourage you to, to read 1 Corinthians chapter 3 because Paul talks about this and he says, the foundation is Christ. And he says, people will build on this foundation different. Some will build on it improperly. And he talks about wood, hay, and other people will build on it properly, gold. And he says, a fire will come. It will be proved that the fire, by the way, is the persecution. The fire is problems. The fire is the desert. Some people will stand and other people not. But this, this is what I love. It ends this way. Those who have things that are burned up, they build with wood, stubble. They couldn't get over the old tapes hump. It says they will still enter in glory, though singed by fire. See, God's gonna, God delivers his people, period. Trust in Jesus, it's done. But others get to not just experience the goodness to come, but there's actually goodness now. And I ain't talking about your pocketbook. I'm not talking about everything working out great in your life. Some of those things happen, but they're not the guarantee. I'm talking about purpose and joy and something worth getting up for every single morning, no matter what the economic up and down is, no matter what your house is worth, whether or not you can buy one or your kids are doing well or not. I'm talking about life where you can gather around somebody like Mother Teresa who had nothing. But oh my goodness, what a rich life. What an absolutely rich life. I'm talking about that. So hopefully that's the fourth camp. You're enjoying the fruit of the promised land. That fruit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control, the evidence of God in your life, not the fact that you're in church or that you're tithing. or No. But this thing that, that those verses end up, and against such things there is no law. In other words, everyone wants more joy and peace and patience and kindness. Everyone wants to grow in it. That's a life worth living. Are you in that camp? As the worship team comes up, I want us to lastly reflect on John chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. This has kind of been the background to everything we've done in this series. This is my prayer and our hope where Jesus says, I am the gate. Just me. Not because he was the, he's the best spiritual prophet among them all. No, because he was God in the flesh who did for us what we could not do for ourselves. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved, period. He will come in and go out and they find, I love this, and find pasture. You'll find those places. Now, sometimes the grass runs out in one place and God's got to move you to another. And in between, it's tough. But he'll lead you to pastures. And then he talks about the world. The thief comes only to steal, to kill, and destroy. The world will say, hey, you know what? This looks good. This tastes good. This will scratch the itch. But ultimately, those things just steal life. They kill life. They destroy life while they promise life. On the other hand, Jesus says, I have come that they, that you and I may have life. Oh, wait, I, I understated it. And have it to the full. That word full is abundantly, wonderfully, amazing. That's his purpose. To move you from the slavery to sin and the old self to freedom in Christ, the abundant life. I pray that we may walk in that abundance in the name of Jesus. Amen.